We are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online Lecture 294. And this is the first session in the Ocular Oncology series. After the amazing UVR sessions, we are now moving on to Ocular Oncology. And today we have with us Dr. Santosh Hanavasa, who will be speaking on ocular surface tumors, the clinical spectrum. And how much ever I would like to introduce the man, the mastermind behind iFocus Online and the man who took IGO to greater heights, I would rather listen to him than spend time on the introduction part. So over to you, sir. You need no introduction. Thank you, Rodika. I'll share my screen. Is it on? Yes, sir. Okay. Today we are beginning ocular oncology and we'll start with ocular surface tumors and I would like to keep it interactive and interaction with the, will be generally with the fellows who are online. So why do we need to do uh, learn ocular surface tumors? Because they are actually staring at your face, begging for a diagnosis. They are up there looking at you and you're looking at them but sometimes you're not able to diagnose them because you don't know their typical clinical features. In fact, they're the most common of all tumors that can happen in and around the eye. And if you don't manage them appropriately, about 20 to 40% can have local tumor recurrence with consequent regional lymph node metastasis and even systemic metastasis. But if you manage them appropriately, having diagnosed them appropriately, chance of local tumor recurrence can be brought down to less than 2%. So if you know about them, you can manage them well, you can diagnose them well, and that is the idea of this talk. If you have a very busy clinic, this is what you may be looking at. Everything may look gray, everything may look similar, everything may look like pterygium, everything may look like pinicula, conjunctival scar, inflammation. In the middle of all that would be hidden something sinister, and that could be a tumor. But fortunately, every tumor comes with a signature. If you're able to identify a signature in a particular tumor, you'll be able to diagnose it. One clinical feature in one tumor is all that you would be looking for. Now, whenever you are dealing with ocular surface tumors as a clinician, you would want to completely eradicate them and make sure that they don't have, you don't have local tumor recurrence or regional lymph node or systemic metastasis. So you have to combine your surgical skills optimally with oncological principles and these oncological principles for ocular surface tumors happen to be accurate diagnosis. And once you have made an accurate diagnosis, you have to objectively assess the extent of the tumor in terms of its uh, horizontal extent, vertical extent, and the depth as well. So you have to demarcate its extent on the surface as well as its depth. Then in, there are some indications for neoadjuvant therapy, which we'll be speaking in the next class then also you need to have margin and base clearance if you're planning surgical excision. And depending on histopathology, histopathology actually guides adjuvant therapy. That again, you need to plan based on histopathology. These are the tumors of the ocular surface. This is the laundry list. Choristoma is included because it comes to an ocular oncologist, but it is not really a tumor. Then we'll have epithelial tumors. We have melanocytic tumors. We have a spectrum of vascular tumors. We also have fibrils, neurals, anthematous, and myxomatous tumors, lymphoid tumors, and secondary tumors, starting with choristoma. Now, one of the fellows will tell us what is hematoma and what is choristoma. What is the difference between the two? Who's going to say that? Ruju, what is hematoma and what is choristoma? What is your understanding? Unmute yourself. Hematomas are basically a uh, normal structure at abnormal uh, location and choristoma is at uh, abnormal tissue at uh, usual site. Abnormal tissue at usual site. What, is, what does that mean? Would you also want to include uh, teratoma in this terminologies? Hematoma and choristoma have mature elements or immature elements? Immature element, sir. And what about teratoma? Does teratoma have immature elements or mature elements? Immature elements, sir. 
immature elements. So teratoma has immature elements and hamartoma and choristomas generally have mature elements. So hamartoma is disorganized tissue. Basically, it is disorganized overgrowth of tissues in their normal location, often with one of the components predominating. It could be epithelial component, it could be a squamal component, it could be a cartilage, it could be an osseous uh, component, it could be even a vascular component. So one of the component generally predominates in a hamartoma. So basically, it is disorganized overgrowth of tissues in their normal location, whereas choristoma is normal tissue growth in an abnormal location. Tissue is normal for any other part of the body, but for the location that it is in, it is abnormal. That is exactly what I meant by these two definitions. So what do you think is this? This is a simple clinical situation where there is something at the limbus. Patient has seen this as a teenager. It really hasn't changed much. So what do you think is this? The limbal dermoid. Yeah, very, very subtle limbal dermoid, which is very small. So every choristoma can be of various sizes. It can start as almost pinhead size, which is normally not even picked up by an ophthalmologist or the patient himself. And it could be about a clock hour in extent like this patient, where the patient can pick up, but it is not elevated. It is absolutely flat at the limbus. So sometimes it is very difficult for an ophthalmologist to diagnose that it is actually a limbal dermoid because in limbal dermoid, you expect some kind of thickness, some kind of keratinization and also hair growth within it, right? So this is actually a limbal dermoid, the lowest in the spectrum, a flat one. Whereas this would, I would call typical because it is two thirds on the cornea, one third on the uh, epibulbar surface, straggling the limbus, more often than not, 50% of limbal dermoids have this kind of a configuration. They're slightly more on the corneal side. There is some disturbance. It's slightly more on the corneal side and less on the epibulbar side. About 25% have equal distribution. They're 50-50 on the corneal as well as epibulbar size, side. And 25% have more on the epibulbar side and less on the corneal side. So this is a typical manifestation of a limbal dermoid. Now, which quadrant is... Uh, most common in terms of limbal dermoid. Where does it more commonly occur? Infrotemporal. Infrotemporal is the most common. About 75% of limbal dermoids are infrotemporal in location. Other locations are equally distributed. You would probably say about 8 to 10% can have uh, can occur in other locations. It may cross the 6 o'clock midline. So even if it is in infrotemporal, it may cross the 6 o'clock midline. So it could be inferior in location about 10% of patients. So basically it is infrotemporal in location. I will ask you what is the cause. Maybe you can read it up and next time you can answer that. Now this is a limbal dermoid which is very characteristic. Why characteristic? Because it has all the features that you would expect. It has keratinization. That means the outer surface has become skin-like. It's not keratin, it is keratinization. And also there are hair follicles. Hair, hair follicles, right? But this also has an atypical feature. Atypical feature here being there is stromal hydration ahead of the lesion. Whenever there is stromal hydration ahead of the lesion or vascularization ahead of the dermoid, that means that it is involving deeper corneal stroma even up to the desmase membrane. So you can actually grade limbal dermoids as grade 1, grade 2, and grade 3. That is classic grading. There's also a new grading system which is based on scoring. Now, classic grading system is that if the limbal dermoid is less than 5 millimeter, it is called grade 1. If it is more than 5 millimeter and it is involving the uh, cornea up to the desmus membrane, not including desmus membrane, that is grade 2. When the limbal dermoid is including full thickness of the cornea, involving the full thickness of the cornea and has intraocular extension, or if it is a complete corneal dermoid, then that is grade 3. Based on that, you can devise your treatment strategies. What are the indications for treatment in a limbal dermoid? Shefali, would you exercise all the dermoids or are there very clear indications? Medical indications. Of course, there are cosmetic indications which may override sometimes, you know, the kind of decision that you would take. But if a patient is not bothered about cosmesis, what are the medical indications for 
excision. So if the limb repair is quite large in size and it's causing a delin. Absolutely. So if it is causing dehel delin ahead of it, resulting in epithelial disturbances or even a single episode of infection, then astigmatism. Astigmatism or incomplete closure. Yeah, incomplete closure of the eye with some part of the dermoid being exposed, astigmatism of more than three diopters, and also symptoms. If a patient has, because of cilia on top of it or keratinization, has epiphora, chronic conjunctival irritation, etc., then also that is an indication. Or if there is stomal hydration and vascularization, that is progressive. So these are the indications for excision of a limbal dermoid. The technique and all we will see in the next uh, session. Sometimes limbal dermoid can be unfortunately bilateral. This is a patient with large limbal dermoid and she has bilaterally. Now, what is the peculiarity about bilateral limbal dermoid? Is there any association with bilateral limbal dermoid? Golden R syndrome, sir. Golden R is typically unilateral. Typically unilateral, okay. Yeah, so what is the association with bilateral limbal dermoid? Is there any association with bilateral limbal dermoid? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any syndrome associated with bilateral limbal dermoid? Oh, mm -hmm. Do you know of any syndromes associated with limbal dermoid? <laughs> mm -hmm. What are the syndromes associated with limbal dermoid? Tell me. Whenever a patient has limbal dermoid, you are not supposed to just look at the eye, you are supposed to look at the rest of the face and the body as well, right? So this is Golden Heart Syndrome. Golden Heart Syndrome because he has preauricular mm -hmm. appendage and that is typically mm -hmm. unilateral. The patient may have starting from anotia to microtia to preauricular appendage. So this was just a preauricular appendage. This patient has uh, Organ auditory canal, deafness as well, and a preauricular sinus. They have hemifacial microsomia. They also have spinal abnormalities. So, what is the other name for Golden Heart Syndrome? Um, or kilo, kilo, uh, cervical, um, spinal. All right. So, these are the associations of limbal dermoid: lit coloboma, iris and choroidal coloboma. Aniridia, microphthalmia, duvans, and related disorders, lacrimal drainage system abnormalities, and even a staphyloma. Now, out of this, what is very important is microphthalmia. In fact, Golden Heart Syndrome, the prognosis that pediatricians have a way of doing, uh, you know, the intellectual capability of a particular individual or mental retardation. The direct prognostic indicator for that is microphthalmia. If a child has limbal dermoid and has relative microphthalmia, that means that the child has a higher chance of having mental retardation or delayed milestones. So that is a prognostic indicator. Now the syndromes we are talking about, this, these are the syndromes. Oculo, auriculo, vertebral dysplasia, described by Ma Morris Goldenar, who was a general ophthalmologist. In his practice, he detected... Uh, couple of patients who had this uh, triad of uh, signs and he described the syndrome and that is Golden Heart Syndrome. There are other syndromes as well, which is one of which is scalp. This, this is slightly advanced for residents, but mainly for the fellows. Scalp is nervous sebaceous, central nervous system malformations, aplasia, cutis congenita, limbal dermoid and pigmented nervous. Vector anomaly is vertebral defects, anal atresia, tracheoesophageal fistula with esophageal atresia and radial hypoplasia and charge syndrome, which is quite famous, coloboma, heart anomaly, clonal atresia, retardation, genital and ear anomalies. Now, all these can have bilateral limbal dermoid. So whenever you have a patient with bilateral limbal dermoid, your antenna should rise and you should suspect that these patients may have other associations, and you should investigate appropriately. Any of these syndromes can have bilateral limbal dermoid. Golden heart is typically, typically unilateral. In fact, if a patient has golden heart syndrome, don't worry too much because golden heart at worst would have spinal abnormalities that too structural and nothing life-threatening unless the patient has microphthalmia, in which situation you would uh, have a higher prognosis, poor prognosis for mental uh, 
abnormalities or slow mentation. Now, what about this? This is grade three or corneal limbal, corneal dermoid. This is not really a limbal dermoid, a corneal dermoid. Now, the peculiarity about corneal dermoid is that it has a tail which can either go nasally or temporally and that can be continuous with the lid. And you can note that the child has extreme medial lid coloboma and a small lid coloboma here as well. So this is a patient with a corneal dermoid. Going to the other spectrum of choristomas, what do you think is this? Dermolipoma. Dermolipoma is a lesion that is typically supratemporal in location. It can have adherence to the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland. For the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland can simply over be overhanging the dermolipoma. We all worry about the lateral rectus and the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland. I'll talk about the surgery in the next class, but basically it is eminently excisable if a patient wants its excision or if it is for cosmetic purposes. And how do you differentiate a dermolipoma from orbital fat prolapse? Um, by application of positive pressure over the globe, if there is a prominence of uh, the lesion, it is suggestive of a uh, fat prolapse and also the border, anterior border of the lesion. Right. So there is a crevice at the anterior border. When you press on the eye without causing vasovagal, gently press on the eye from the nasal side, it becomes more prominent. When you use a wet cotton tipped applicator and push it in supratemporally, it goes in. And the moment, or you can do that reduction transpalpably also, the moment you relieve your pressure, it pops back. There is one more differential diagnosis, especially if it is unilateral. Orbital fat prolapse is typically bilateral, although it may be asymmetrical. But if it is unilateral, it could even be a lymphoproliferative lesion involving the palpebral lobe of the lacrimal gland. You should be aware that that can also present exactly in a similar location. But this fat prolapse is typically in which plane? Which plane of the eye? Subconjunctival or subtenance? It is typically under the tenance. That is why this crevice. If you find this crevice, it's very, very characteristically orbital fat prolapse. So you know how it looks and also the color itself. This is pale pink or yellow or yellow white, whereas this is more intense pink and almost tending to be fleshy. Now, there are other locations of uh, dermolipoma as well. This is exactly at the lateral canthus, neither superior nor inferior. Bang lateral canthal location, close up view of the same. You can see that it is lateral canthal. And this patient has both limbal dermoid as well as a dermolipoma. So both are there in the same patient. You can see a subtle limbal dermoid and a much more pronounced dermolipoma in the lateral canthus. And that is the area of keratinization. The skin is continuous. Sometimes this can actually overrun. Skin can overrun the dermolipoma in a very predominant way. This is an example of a dermolipoma with a cutaneous appendage. You can see a nice cutaneous append appendage which actually had involved the lateral canthal angle. Lateral canthal angle was destroyed by this cutaneous appendage and it was adherent or continuous with the dermolipoma that was lying inside. So there could be a cutaneous appendage that may be associated with dermolipoma. There are situations where dermolipoma can be deep and there are occasions when dermolipoma may be so deep that the lateral uh, rectus itself may be partially deformed or even be absent or partially uh, mild developed so that, that those patients will have ocular motility disturbances as well. Now, dermolipoma can also occur in other locations. This is a patient where there is infronasal or nasal dermolipoma. 90% of dermolipomas are supratemporal. About 10% can be in other locations, mainly in the lateral canthal area, infrotemporal. Nasal location is very rare. This is a patient again where there is infronasal dermolipoma, extremely rare situation. This is also a dermolipoma, but it is more on the bulbar surface. Of course, there is contiguity into the medial fornix, but it is more of a, a, you know bulbar location. It is not a limbal dermoid, although it is touching the limbus and deforming the limbal architecture just a little bit on histopathology. It was confirmed that it was indeed a derm dermolipoma in a slightly atypical location. Now, what about this? What do you think is this? This is not really a limbal dermoid, isn't it? 
limbal dermoids have this three eighth of a circle configuration. When you cut a circle, it has this kind of a configuration. When the surface is irregular and it is shallow, and this is broad based and it has this whitish architecture and its anterior edge is irregular. And when you touch, it is not going to indent. This is hard or firm. So this is called osseous choristoma. Osseous choristoma will have ossified cartilage, cartilage or even bone. The problem with osseous choristoma is that it is deeper. If this is the sclera, osseous choristoma can be as deep as 90%. So when you start excising it, it suddenly peels off and what you're left with is very thin, tectonically unstable sclera. So you should be careful when you are planning to excise osseous choristoma and it is very difficult for you to know how deep it is because even with UBM, there would be shadowing artifact. OCT, of course, will not even show how deep it is because it is so dense. And MRI or CT, if you do, there would be averaging art artifact which will show that it is almost full thickness. So you should always have a tectonic uh, sclera or corneal graft uh, with you when you want to excise an osseous choristoma. This is a different variety of choristoma, which is at 12 o'clock limbus. It can be anywhere around the limbus. It could even be on the epibulbar surface. This is a small cyst within it. You can see a cyst which has recently burst. Otherwise, it can form small cysts within it. That means that it has secretory activity. And when you excise this, you will find gland within it. This patient had a lacrimal gland choristoma. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the rare variants of choristoma. This patient also looked as if he had a limbal dermoid, but its anterior surface was irregular, which is very atypical for limbal dermoid. Limbal dermoid would have a very crisp anterior surface. This patient incidentally also had a small limbal dermoid, which shows that a same patient can have multiple variants of choristoma. We thought this was an atypical limbal dermoid, excised it, but it also contained lacrimal gland tissue. So whenever there is an irregular anterior surface, you should not think that it is a limbal dermoid. It could be a different variety of choristoma. And this was one such lacrimal gland choristoma. Neurolika ji, this is for you. Would you be worried about this patient? This patient has bilateral choristoma. Forget about all the syndromes that I mentioned because this patient does not have limbal dermoid, right? So this patient has a different variety of choristoma, which has various colors within it. And this patient also has a shallow lid coloboma as cutaneous appendages, a subcutaneous nodule. Yes. So it's a complex choristoma because it has... Right. So it's a complex choristoma. And whenever you have a patient with complex choristoma, would you be worried about it? Syndromic, sir. Mm -hmm. The depth, it will be more invasive. What about the depth, depth systemically? Bilateral complex choristoma with bald patches on the scalp, with greasy looking mm -hmm. nevi on the face, just mm -hmm. an abdomen. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. of Yadison. This is a complex choristoma with cancer predisposition. So, whenever you have a patient with complex choristoma, unilaterally or bilaterally, mm -hmm. you should look at their scalp very carefully. Even if you find one bald patch like this anywhere in the scalp, that clinically confirms the diagnosis that the patient has nevus sebaceous of Yadison, which is a cancer predisposition syndrome. Other associations of nevus sebaceous of Yadison, apart from the features that I just mentioned, are ciliary body cartilage. Another example of ciliary body cartilage would be Patau syndrome and chocolate cartilage and osseous choristoma of the choroid. Typically, you would call it choroidal osteoma, but whenever you have a syndrome associated with it, you call it osseous choristoma. This is also a choroidal osteoma probably, but since we are dealing with other choristomas in the same patient, you would simply call it osseous choristoma. And this is a periocular choristoma where there is pigmented. This is a pigmented choristoma, unilateral raccoonae involving the entire um, area around the eye, unilateral and associated with complex choristoma and also a skin tag. There is no name to this syndrome. You can give your own name if you will. But this is one more complex choristoma. We don't know the systemic associations of this. So nevus sebaceous of Yadison, just a few words. It's also called organoid nevus syndrome, described by Joseph Jadison in 1895. It uh, includes hematoma of pylor sebaceous follicular units and uh, 
it is also associated with other syndromes which i have shown in the screen there's no point describing them because these are very advanced um, information for ocular oncology fellows if at all somebody is interested otherwise you can forget about it this is too much of theory here but just to emphasize that any patient with complex choristoma you should look for syndromic variation uh, associations so these are the choristomas that we talked about now let's go on to epithelial tumors we have a bunch of epithelial tumors starting from squamous epithelial tumors uh, which can be benign papilloma hereditary benign intraepithelial discerotosis and pre malignant or malignant which are bunched together in ocular surface squamous neoplasia now ruju what do you think is this Uh, sir, looks like uh, papilloma. Why do you say it is papilloma? It has a typical architecture, isn't it? It has it has a central vessel from which there are radiating blood vessels, right? And if you move it with a cotton tip deplicator, you'll find that it has a heavy top from which there are radiating blood blood vessels, a small pedicle, and then it is attached to the base. since the top is heavy top collapses on the pedicle so when you look at the patient up front you will not be able to see its pedunculated nature but when you just simply move it you will be able to see that it is actually pedunculated it is not sessile very rarely it could be sessile and it has a base of conjunctiva to which it is attached so it is a typical conjunctival papilloma now question to subha which virus causes it just let me get my watch yeah Right, the human papilloma virus. That's a very uh, broad information that you have given. That is that is not what I would expect from you. Human papilloma virus. Eleven sixteen. Sixteen is the incomplete information. HPV six. Six sixteen. Anything else? So it caused eleven. By, yes, six eleven sixteen thirty three and forty five. These cause papillomas. and these are the same viruses which cause cutaneous wart not cutaneous papilloma so this is shared with cutaneous wart not cutaneous papillomas and these are the uh, strains of the viruses that can cause it one more typical papilloma central vessel with radiating blood vessels from it now this could always be sessile as i said rarely this is a aggressive sessile variant of papilloma it was not pedunculated this is much aggressive sessile variant of papilloma almost looking like squamous cell carcinoma in fact clinically my diagnosis in this situation would be squamous cell carcinoma because that is more common in this kind of a clinical picture on histopathology it did turn out to be an aggressive papilloma papilloma can always be pigmented especially in asian indians thus mimicking us conjunctival melanoma this is so darkly pigmented that you cannot deny that it looks like conjunctival melanoma but what gives away is this typical papilloma here which has a central vessel and radiating vessels so this is a pigmented papilloma so whenever you have an very ag aggressive looking papilloma then you have to think in terms of immunomodulation these patients don't settle down with surgery alone they may have a higher chance of recurrence so interferon is one cimetidine levomazole have other indications primarily for which they are used but they also have immunomodulatory properties because of which they can be used in papilloma so patients of this sort can be treated with immunomodulation i'll come to that in the next lecture basically this patient had extensive papilloma with intranasal extension and he finally settled on with interferon one more patient with papilloma who settled with interferon now you should always look for variants of papilloma especially if a patient has bilateral multifocal papilloma then the chance that the patient may have immunosuppression is very high this patient had a renal transplantation quite a few years ago she was on oral immunomodulation and she de promptly developed a papilloma in the right eye which is fairly typical but in the left eye it is inverted the apex is small and the base is broad so you can see a broader base and a smaller apex which indicates that it is an inverted papilloma which has a higher chance of it being squamous cell carcinoma no papilloma can also overhang from the fornix this patient has a fornicial papilloma and that is causing some amount of mucor discharge because of which the patient came on examination of the ocular surface we found that there was a papilloma no this is for the senior most fellow this is not my picture i we won't see this in india 
but since you're very um, you know i think you're moving to your international fellowship components you'll be able to see these patients more often than uh, what we ever would see so what do you think is rolika rolika are you on has she logged out i can't see her hmm what is this ayushi do you want to help a uh, good evening sir uh, good evening. is this kawasaki disease let's not kawasaki disease okay. this patient has keratinization of the lips tongue and the ocular surface and this is very typically called i have Her- given the hereditary epi- benign intraepithelial dysplasia dyskeratosis dyskeratosis sorry yeah so this is seen in navajo indians so this is a this is a disease seen in triracials indians that means red indians uh, blacks and caucasians so whenever there is a mixture of three races this is typically seen in that kind of a uh, epidemiological situation and this is seen mainly in the united states so you have these patients coming up with what looks like ocular surface squamous neoplasia but they actually have this condition now what about this shefali unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis you don't need to think much about it. so what do you dis- what do you think is this what if i show you the close up picture quickly we don't have much time i think we are already across 30 minutes diagnosis so i would uh, diagnose it at diffuse ossn diffuse ossn but you should never diagnose an ocular surface tumor unless you have seen the entire ocular surface which is the eyelid so when you flip the eyelid you find that the lid margin is grossly thickened and sharp posterior lid margin is all rounded you don't see any meibomian gland orifices and the lashes are sparse which indicates that it is actually pegetoid sebaceous gland carcinoma now as opposed to that this patient also has unilateral blepharoconjunctivitis but he has this white spots which is nothing but keratin keratin is a, a kind of a marker of high epithelial cell turnover so whenever you find keratin you diagnose it as ocular surface squamous neoplasia right so this is a difference between the two both look almost the same except that this patient has keratin so whenever there is keratin you tend to di- diagnose it as ocular surface squamous neoplasia this patient has what looks like peripheral ulcerative keratitis in fact he was being treated by a cornea specialist for the same with conjunctival dissection glue bcl etc for the peripheral corneal gutta but he also has a scleral extension and a patch of keratin indicating that he has ocular surface squamous neoplasia this patient also was diagnosed as murren sulcer elsewhere you can see an amniotic membrane that has been done by the cornea specialist in that area for whatever benefit he had conjunctival dissection but what was missed was this nodule which also has keratin so ocular surface squamous neoplasia can mimic a lot of diseases and here it is mim- mimicking peripheral ulcerative keratitis one more situation where a patient was being treated as a case of peripheral ulcerative keratitis even with acetabulin immunomodulators and he has advanced ocular surface neoplasia which is mucoepidermoid variant they can also present with a corneal melt like this a limbal melt with no collagen vascular disease and exuded protein what is the disturbance that we have in the audio you can mute yourself if you're not answering at this point in time so when this was excised this area was excised and repaired by a on a specialist using a patch graft is a great job but when this tissue was sent to the pathologist they diagnosed it as ocular surface squamous neoplasia this is a patient where what looks like a uh, necrotizing scleritis right but he has keratin so whenever there is keratin you should suspect that it could be ossn which is causing this necrotizing scleritis not the immunologically mediated one this patient even had a phototherapeutic keratectomy what for what was diagnosed as a superficial corneal scar 
you can see that this is right at the epithelium not even involving the stroma when it recurred and this patient has abnormal vascularity at the limbus with whitish opacity which is nothing but a epithelial component of ocular surface squamous neoplasia where the conjunctival component is very subtle so this is also a possibility now these are the masquerades of ossn all six patients look different and this is what is called the typical spectrum of ossn again all the six patients look different so the ossn is the most common conjunctival malignant lesion in asian indians but it has so many morphological variants that sometimes it can become difficult for you to diagnose that is the reason when you look at the literature you find that ossn is the primary diagnosis in only in one third of patients when it presents to an ophthalmologist first and two third or uh, two thirds of them are diagnosed as other benign or other malignant or conditions or even inflammatory lesions or scars etc so it is the most commonly misdiagnosed ocular surface lesion do you have any differential diagnosis for this very typical isn't it whenever a patient has a lesion right at the limbus because ossn is a lesion of the limbal stem cells along with this excessive vascularity and keratin and it stains with rose bengal you are supposed to diagnose it as ossn clinically this is one more ocular surface squamous neoplasia you can always see that it is right at the limbus with excessive vascularity mostly with keratin sometimes it may not have keratin and the surface may be shining in which situation it would be a mucoepidermoid variant this is again a ossn right at the limbus with a small corneal epithelial component and vascularity this vascularity is very typical small or large vascularity is always there this patient has slightly a different variant with lot of keratin a very broad base corneal epithelial invasion and lot of vascularity again a patient where there is predominantly corneal lesion with small amount of conjunctival component but lot of vascularity so these are the typical variants of ossn a much larger lesion with slightly less vascularity this is the mucoepidermoid variant where the surface is actually shining whenever there is a shine on the surface you clinically tend to diagnose it as a mucoepidermoid variant this is a papilliform variant of ossn it actually looks like a conjunctival papilloma but this excessive vascularity is a giveaway this is a papilliform variant of ossn whereas this is a diffuse variant of ossn where it is very very flat and plucoid there is no elevated component here at all diffuse variants are amenable to topical therapy whereas this is a very fleshy variant of ossn you can see it is very aggressive and these aggressive forms are often seen in hiv positive patients or immunocompromised patients this is a pigmented variant of ossn you can see that it actually can look like a nevus or even a melanoma now do you bring in any differential diagnosis for this patient does it look like ossn remember everything that i said this is not at the limbus ossn is a tumor of the limbal stem cells so this is not at all at the limbus slightly away from the limbus vascularity is all there but this small nodules that you see if you were to see the same lesion on the eyelid with these small pearly white nodules what would you diagnose it as molluscum yeah. molluscum contagious yeah this is a molluscum of the conjunctiva and what about this if a patient has bilateral this kind of lesions flat lesions with some amount of pigmentation and he is a construction worker what would you diagnose this actinic keratosis right it could be a precursor of a lesion malignant lesion but it is typically actinic keratosis now what about this this patient has this fleshy pink nodule slightly away from the limbus with some kind of a membrane on the surface not pronounced vascularity difficult to diagnose this but this turned out to be a conjunctival granuloma of unknown etiology so conjunctival granuloma can also masquerade as ossn so ossn can masquerade as other lesions and other lesions can masquerade as ossn this looked like ossn but he had a small vascular lesion right at the apex there was one feeder vessel this was capillary hemangioma of the conjunctiva with some amount of actinic keratosis around it and what do you think is this arginine granuloma ha 
it could be a biogenic granulation absolutely right so this patient has undergone some kind of conjunctival surgery and this on top of this is a biogenic granuloma with excess a very aggressive simplexron and this is one more conjunctival biogenic granuloma right at the lateral canthus so there are many lesions that can mimic osm and vice versa but what is important is for us to remember that there are three signs of ocular surface squamous neoplasia which you must elicit in every given patient with a conjunctival lesion number one is keratin if there is keratin in a particular lesion then that is highly sensitive and specific for ossm sensitivity is only 80% but specificity is quite high so whenever there is keratin most likely it is ocular surface squamous neoplasia apart from keratin if there is abnormal vascular pattern abnormal vascular pattern would mean feeder vessel and intrinsic vasculature would add to sensitivity and specificity in a big way now if you stain that with rose bengal that pink area is stained with rose bengal then your diagnostic sensitivity and specificity is almost as good as the gold standard that is histopathology so this one slide would tell you that if a patient has a conjunctival lesion it may look like a terigem pingicula inflammation scar pyogenic granuloma or whatever you have but it has a spot of keratin has abnormal vascularity and also stains with rose bengal then you should give it lot of respect and think that it is ocular surface squamous neoplasia now if you still have any doubt you can do anterior segment oct this is described by dr carol kap was uh, described that if the normal corneal epithelium which is about 65 to 70 micron thick becomes hyper reflective grayish to white hyperplastic increases in thickness and abruptly truncates with a snout like ending then that is a sign of ocular surface squamous neoplasia so if you have any clinical confusion at all then you can always do anterior segment oct oct will also help you uh diagnose the depth of the lesion which will be very useful when you want to perform surgical intervention like this patient where there's a corneal osis and we could not have known that there was full thickness stromal invasion this is the normal stroma you can see stroma is played here there's some amount of hyperreflectivity within the stroma unless we did this imaging now the, clearly this is not a case for simple excision the patient will either need a tectonic graft or we need to do plaque bracket therapy the only problem with imaging is that if there is lot of keratin there is shadowing artifact both on ubm as well as uh, asoct thus precluding the diagnosis of the depth now systemic associations of ossn these are some of the associations there are many others minor associations but xeroderma pigmentosum hiv zero positivity any form of immunosuppression for example even organ post organ transplant iotogenic immunosuppression would cause bilateral ossn in a young individual which has a higher chance of recurrence higher chance of regional lymph node extension and systemic uh, involvement palmoplantar keratoderma and also vkc can have association with ossn these features that i mentioned early onset bilateral multifocal can also have palpebral conjunctival involvement they can also have periocular papillomas you can see this patient has periocular papilloma and multifocal ossn he was hiv zero positive palm palm plantar keratoderma described by uh, one of my fellows ramesh murthy along with me was uh, is congenital hereditary and this is published actually patients have changes in their palm and as well as nail beds and have periodontosis and bilateral ocular surface squamous neoplasia which can be quite aggressive agcc classification of agcc 8 is something which you must remember uh tnm classification and this is uh, you can just take a picture of this because we don't have time to explain this but this is something that as an ocular oncology fellow you are supposed to be aware of this is not really required for the residents residents can simply say that agcc 8 is the one that we use for grading of ocular surface squamous neoplasia going on to melanocytic tumors there are many of them but we will only stick to the common ones now in melanocytic tumors it's very important to differentiate which is good which is bad and which is ugly like this patient has extensive pigmentation of the conjunctiva in fact all of us will tend to have some conjunctival pigmentation we being asian indians we have a predisposition to conjunctival pigmentation darker we have we are the more is the pigmentation more sun exposed we are more is the pigmentation more aged we are more is the pigmentation more is our conjunctival irritation either because of allergic conjunctivitis or vkc or anti glaucoma medications which are preservatives more is the pigmentation 
more is the makeup that we use, use around the eye, more is the pigmentation. So any source of irritation or actinic exposure can increase the chance of pigmentation of green Treva in patients who are predisposed such as Asian Indians. But when it is unilateral, there is a reason to worry. These are the pigmentations that we find. Now there are uh, pigmentation that is called facial melanosis or complexion associated melanosis. This is very common. This is, tends to be bilateral and has this cobblestone kind of an architecture. There could be some fine pigmentation of the peripheral cornea. There could be some phonicial pigmentation. There could be pigmentation of the plica and the uh, caruncle. But tarsal component is quite uncommon. They could even have a lid margin pigmentation. But as long as it is bilateral and nearly symmetrical, this is nothing but racial melanosis or complexion associated melanosis. All you need to do is simply observe this patient and if a patient complains of cosmetic concern, like this patient may have cosmetic concern, then you can excise it or do cryotherapy or even uh, for that matter, do a peritomy here and do a reverse cryotherapy. So cryotherapy can reduce the intensity of the pigmentation. Of course, excision can also help improve the cosmetic um, appearance. But whenever there is asymmetry, they say patients of this sort where there is gross pigmentation in one eye and the other eye is nearly white, has some limbal pigmentation that goes with the age and race of the patient, then you should worry about primary acquired melanosis. Primary acquired melanosis has a predisposition to develop conjunctival melanoma and that is the reason why we should worry about it. It is typically seen in middle-aged individuals, unilateral, flat, has no cysts at all and has this peppery appearance no cobblestones or microfolds. It even extends to the palpable conjunctiva and the phonicial conjunctiva. You can see that this patient has one eye bulbar uh, pigmentation, which is actually racial. In the other eye, the patient has a patch on the palpable conjunctiva that was primary acquired melanosis. This is the kind of morphology that it has. A lot of pepper being sprinkled on a white surface. This has a small granules which are confluent that's why it is called peppery appearance. One more typical example of a peppery appearance. So what is the incidence of uh, or the risk of development of melanoma in primary acquired melanosis? It ranges from 9 to 32% depending on which series that you are looking at. But what is important is that PAM with atypia has a high chance of it developing melanoma. And unless you biopsy it, you will never know whether it has atypia or not. So biopsy is the key. Clinically, it is impossible to differentiate PAM without ATPR from PAM with ATPR. Size matters a lot here. Every clock hour adds to the odds ratio one by 1 1.7 times. So practically, if you have a patient of primary acquired melanosis or if you're suspecting a patient with PAM, as long as it is small, one to two clock hours, you can simply watch it. You really don't have to do anything aggressive for a small PAM. Anything less than 10 millimeter is supposed to be watched. Anything more than 10 millimeter or has slight amount of thickness on slit damp evaluation, you're supposed to biopsy. This is a patient with about seven clock hours of PAM, which means that the patient has 12 times higher risk of it developing into a melanoma. Obviously, in that situation, you would excess all the involved conjunctiva and then do a histopathology. And if at all there is any residual element, you can cryo it or use topical mitomycin C. Otherwise, you can do MAP biopsy. For patients with extensive PAM, obviously, you have to do MAP biopsy to confirm which areas are involved before taking further steps. This is a patient with phonicial PAM involving both the plica as well as caruncle in addition to the phonics. This is again a patient with a superior phonicial PAM and you can see a nodule that is developing from it. That's a melanoma. Inferior phonicial PAM and a nodule that is developing at the medial canthus and that's a melanoma. So this is a patient with extensive inferior phonicial PAM. Recently, it has changed. It's become quite leathery and thick. The entire area had melanoma. It had developed melanoma. And these are breakout areas, fleshy areas from the melanoma, which are broken out of a flattish crest of the lesion. So there's one more uh, terminology that is used for PAM. This is called... What is this? Semen. What is semen? Conjunctival melanocytic intraepithelial melanocytic neoplasia. Right? So 
conjunctival intraepithelial melanocytic neoplasia was described and there is a scoring system as well horizontal spread and vertical spread and melanocytic atyp atypia and you're supposed to uh, add up these scores and then that indicates the risk okay there are four lesions here all of them on the bulba conjunctiva now which one is a nevus and which one is not a nevus quickly we just have 10 minutes all are nevus all are nevus ruju quickly all except uh, right lower quadrant except this this is not a nevus you think right okay so if you have a patient of what looks like nevus in front of you this is your mental clinical checklist interpalpable location variable pigmentation pigmentation ranging from tan brown to dark brown no corneal invasion no episcleral fixation which you easily can detect by transpalpably moving the lesion on the bulbar surface or using a wet bud to move it no intrinsic vascularity, feeder vessels are excusable, and mitosis. So going back to the picture, all of them are located in interpalpable location except this. This is in the superior vulva conjunctiva, but that does not excuse it from being called an evus. This does not have corneal epithelial invasion. This is like a fat belly which is overhanging a pelt. It's a big nevus or a you know fat nevus which is overhanging, but there is no corneal epithelial invasion. Epithelial invasion would have this serrated edges with a pigmented ca pigment carried forth. So all of these are nevi, all of them have feeder vessels, but no intrinsic vascularity. If you have any doubt at all, you can do imaging. You will find microcysts and macrocysts, which confirm that it is a nevus. Nevi are spongy, whereas melanoma is much solid. Now, if you really want to remember data, you can remember this, this is from the largest series put together. Bulbar conjunctiva has about 70% distribution of nevus. Carankel has about 15%. Plica has about 11%. So, medially, if at all a nevus is located, it is likely to be located in the carankel and plica. Otherwise, it is most common in the temporal bulbar conjunctiva. So, temporal bulbar conjunctiva is the most common location for a nevus, followed by nasal bulbar conjunctiva. Superior and inferior are very rare. Together, superior and inferior contribute to only 10% of the location of the nevus. Tarsal, corneal and phonicial location of nevus is very uncommon. So they are either located in the bulba conjunctiva or in the carankel and plica. Carankular and plica nevi are very small. Nevi can be amelonotic. Like this patient has a fleshy lesion with a feeder vessel, what looks like intrinsic vasculature, just a little bit of breach of the limbal barrier. But the patient has microsis confirming that it is an amelonotic nevus. Nevi can be bilateral as well. Nevi are not only unilateral. This patient has bilateral nevus. Nevi are typically diagnosed clinically by the presence of cysts. Now, this is again from a larger series, but it has a Caucasian epidemiology. Nevi can be amelonotic in 15% of Caucasians. In Asian Indians, Nevi can be amelonotic in only 5%. About 65% of nevi have clinically detectable cysts. But if you add UBM or ASOCT to it, the number 65% will go up to 95%. Only about 5% of nevi may be so flat that they may not have any cysts at all. Otherwise, most of them will have cysts. But of course, you must remember that cysts are not pathognomonic for a nevus. They can be seen in lymphangiectasia and also mucopodoma, squamosal carcinoma. Whenever a nevus has a cyst, and the cyst disappears and a solid lesion grows, that means that a nevus is transforming into a melanoma. The risk is about 1 in 300 in Caucasians, whereas in Asian Indians, the risk is slightly more 1% or 1 in 100. This is my own patient who always had a nevus in the supranasal bulba conjunctiva. He had it for about 15 years, then he went off to study in a different city. And after about 8 or 9 years, he came back with a freshly grown solid lesion which is arising from a pre-existing nevus. And it also has a fleshy component, some bit of subconjunctival hemorrhage, etc. You can see high vascularity that has recently developed from this. When we did a UBM here, we find that there is a solid lesion and a lesion with some cysts. So when we excised it, this is very nice specimen. You can see there is a zone of transition 
this cystic lesion still conforms to the nevus, whereas this solid lesion, which we detected on UBM, conforms to the melanoma. So, and this is the line of transition. So, whenever a nevus turns into a melanoma, it loses cysts. And that's one of the very characteristic or reliable signs. Now, about melanoma itself, melanoma is more elevated, modular, has a fleshy kind of architecture because of aggressive vascularity. And that's, it has blood vessels coming from all the layers. They could be intrascleral channels. You can see this, this is an intrascleral channel. They could be episcleral channel. They could be a subtenous channel, a subconjunctival channel, and even a conjunctival vessel. So, nevi are very hungry. They need vascularity to grow. And these blood vessels come from all directions to feed a nevus. So high vascularity and a fleshy architecture differentiates a nevus from a melanoma from a nevus. This patient has what looks like a plica nevus. So whenever, as a dictum, whenever a patient has any pigmentation which is abnormal in any part of the eye or in the eyelid, you should always examine the rest of the ocular surface. Even with double aversion, this patient has what looks like a plica nevus, but it is actually a melanoma in the palpable conjunctiva. This patient also has a melanoma, which is a very nodular melanoma and also has a scleral component. So, is this a melanoma? Same patient, four different pictures, almost a black eye. Is this a melanoma? Shafali, what is missing here? Vascularity is missing. Eye is white, isn't it? So whenever there is no vascularity, and if you go back to the history, this patient says that he always had it as far as he remembers, then this could be a very extensive nevus. A balloon cell variant of nevus can be as extensive as this. This is a cellular variant of nevus. So this is this actually turned out to be a balloon cell variant of Nevus. This is a lot of cysts and very extensive involvement of the bulbar surface. That's the close-up picture. You can see that there is absolutely no vascularity, right? So that's a very clear differentiator between a nevus and a melanoma. And what about this? Subhaji, you look sleepy. Hmm. Unmute yourself. What is? What do you think is this? So uh, it's a elevated plaque-like lesion. Mm -hmm. uh, feeder vessels, hmm. the center being the limbus, and there is intrinsic vascularity. Hmm. It looks like a melanoma, conjunctival melanoma. Why do you miss keratin? We talked about keratin so much. Yes. So, what could this be? A pigmented uh, variant of pigmented OSSN. OSSN. All right. So, you have differential diagnosis for a nevus. This is Shafali. What do you think is this? This patient is just about to get married and she comes with this nevus and she wants it taken off because she doesn't want it to come in the picture. So she has an iris lesion also. If mm. we... mm. And what about a cornea? Is it clear? Cornea is not clear, sir. Ah, so there seems to be some stromal edema and epithelial edema as well. So, she may have high intraocular pressure. Her pressure was 38. So, what's your diagnosis? It can be a ciliary body. Uh... This was a ring melanoma of the iris and trabecula meshwork with extraocular component. Finally, she needed enucleation and she did have a white eye for a marriage and that was an artificial eye. <laughs> it could be as extensive as this. You, you, you see how innocuous it looks, a small patch of pigment in the conjunctiva. So whenever you see a patch of pigment not in the conjunctiva, this is subconjunctival. You should differentiate its location. And if it is subconjunctival in the sclera, episclerally, you should always do gonioscopy and rule out a lurking melanoma or even a ciliary body melanoma. If you find a patch of pigmentation here, subconjunctively, you should always rule out a ciliary body melanoma with extraocular extension. What do you think is this? Tolika? What do you think is this? Quickly. She's gone? No, she's here. Okay. What do you think is this? A fleshy pink lesion with a patient with pigmentation disorder, right? So, mm -hmm. looking at the color itself, you could think it is a lymphoproliferative lesion or a squamous cell lesion, but 
in patients who have a pigmentary disorder like uh, vitiligo melanoma can be amelanotic mm-hmm. this was a amelanotic melanoma and what about this who wants to take this quickly neva mm-hmm. mm-hmm. neva sofota neva sofota correct neva sofota will have periocular pigmentation and this is not conjunctival your level of pigmentation is very important that is scleral melanocytosis you should always look for the soft palate and the hairline if the palate is pigmented that means that they have a high chance of having esophageal melanocytosis and a esophageal melanoma as a consequence if the hairline pigmentation is present they are pro- uh, predisposed to have meningeal melanocytosis with a meningeal melanoma as a consequence so you should always look for the clinical telltale signs of these entities and also look at their fundus for a possible melanocytic lesion which can develop into a melanoma i think time is and uh, over so i could cover this the very small uh, tumors left so this could be covered you can continue sir no no next class along with management which will not take one hour so i would stop here take questions and this vascular fibrous and lymphoid tumors etc can be covered in the next class and that would be perfectly all right okay so uh, i thank you yeah any questions you may have so thank you for covering it so beautifully and uh, i don't think any of us can get enough of it we were happy that for you to continue the class here uh, there are some questions that have been uh, asked one question was from dr ayushi she asked that uh, for the uh, lesions would you like to do an hpv test specifically in papilloma patients would you like to do it provisionally no you can do hpv test but really that doesn't change your management right so it doesn't mean that if a patient has human papilloma virus infection related papilloma that doesn't mean that the patient has genital hpv infection there is no association at all right so the it really doesn't matter you can do it if you want to do it in fact ossn was also considered one, at one time related to human papilloma virus infection a lot of studies that were done but it is multifactorial so viral study can be done as a marker but really it doesn't help you in terms of management right so uh, so another question is that so what would be the aggressive variants of uh, squamous cell carcinoma um like pathological variations pathological variations would be mucopodermoid carcinoma that has a higher chance of having scleral invasion and intraocular extension and uh, second is spindle cell variant which is a histopathological variant which also has a higher chance of scleral invasion and intraocular extension clinically they are seen as uh, fleshy pink lesions which have less keratin and more of uh, uh, vascularity and uh, they are broad based and uh, they grow very rapidly and most important they don't take up rose bengal staining they have a smooth uh, conjunctiva on top of it so basically the epithelium is less uh, visibly clinically disturbed slightly sub epithelial in terms of its uh, location that is adenosquamous also uh... yes yeah. so another question by dr ayushi that if we have only a keratin plaque uh with no vascularity or pigmentation do hmm. we observe or do we start the treatment hmm. considering it can be a an actinic keratosis if there is keratin and if you think that it is right at the limbus and it is taking rose bengal i would rather excise it because keratin predominant oscn does not respond to topical therapy actinic keratosis will not have predominant keratin keratin plaque would mean that the patient most likely has ocular surface squamous cell right so so the last question that uh, uh, has come up is that uh, which would which is the telltale sign or like you know uh, an alarming sign for intraocular invasion in cases with the versus right so there are certain signs which will tell you that the patient may have intraocular extension one is that it is fixed to episclera it is not movable second is that when you look at the anterior chamber you will find cells which are white large cells or keratic precipitates which are white grayish large keratic precipitates much larger than the keratic precipitates that you even find in granulomatous uveitis next thing is that they could be d shaped pupil in the quadrant where the tumor is located 
D-shaped pupil in the sense that pupil is not circular. The edge of the pupil becomes slightly straightish. Okay, that is the second. Third is that when you do gonioscopy, if you're able to do gonioscopy despite the tumor being there, you will find that the tumor sitting in the anterior chamber angle. They could be neovascularization of the eyes or there is high intraocular pressure. All these are the signs of anterior segment invasion. Most of the patients may have ciliary body invasion, especially if a patient has been subjected to multiple excisions earlier elsewhere. There could be breach in the sclera, which would let the tumor into ciliary body. In that situation, sometimes it's difficult to clinically diagnose. So whenever a patient has multiple surgeries earlier elsewhere, or if you find any of the signs that I mentioned for anterior segment invasion, you would be better off doing a quick UBM. Right, sir. So thank you for covering all the questions and uh, uh, absolutely covering it uh, in, you know, the way the postgraduates as well as the fellows, as well as the consultants, all of us are uh, happy to learn from. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, the next session, which will be on the 10th of April, will be the continuation of this class, as well as with the management component of ocular surface tumors. Sure. Thank right. you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you, sir. Good night.